I'd like to speak to you this morning about addressing unionism with concord, but like uh, many things in my life with things going on, my mom passing away this summer, my dad moving into assisted living, my mom, my mother-in-law moving into assisted living, uh, one in Dallas, one in Frankenmuth, Michigan, trying to find a new teacher for our school. Uh, the, I'm almost embarrassed for you to have the document that you have in front of you right now because it's kind of half-baked and uh, I'll probably be going off script a little bit as we go uh, through it. I think, uh, Gary, do you have that other document too? That So it's, it's there. Uh, something else I had spent a little more time on uh, about the time of the Yankee Stadium prayer service, which you might find a little more useful as well. Uh, so if, if this uh, gets too bad, we can always talk about that, or I'd be happy to relate some stories from my... Uh, meeting with David Benke, there are some things that, you know, can be documented, other things that are just kind of visual. Uh, I was kind of hoping Richard Boland would be here to help remember some of those things, but um, as we sat around the table, uh, Dr. Schultz was at the end, and Boland was here, James Brower here, I was here, uh, and I can't remember, it was Mr. Berg, one of the, the lay representative, and then on the other side, Don Matzant, um, David Benke, and Chip Fralick, and uh, Wallace had his wife, Kathy, transcribing the whole thing. So you maybe heard Pastor Poppy talking about uh, the big document that Wallace Schultz gave to 10 people, uh, which I was one as well. But that's all on a, in a PDF document now. And I shared that with Gary. And he might be able to share that by putting that on to the website for you all. Uh, it was fascinating for me to reread it again, especially since Kathy had... You know, literally transcribed, you know, Brondus said this, Benke said this, Boland said this. It's all there uh, pretty much word for word, what went on in that face-to-face -face meeting. I was I asked here if he might see if somebody would be willing to reenact that whole thing. I, I was trying to decide uh, who would play me, but uh, we couldn't come up with anything. But you, you still might enjoy reading some of those things. Um, but you know, and as part of the visual, uh, that, that Don Matzat, who you, you might recall was the first host of Issues, et cetera, uh, he came wearing a Mickey Mouse tie. Now, tell me that he wasn't trying to make some kind of comment on what we were trying to do there. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't realize, too, that the first day of our meeting, David Benke refused to talk to us at all about it. They, they insisted that we drop our complaint before he would talk about it. So we spent a whole day with him refusing to talk to us. And finally, at the end of the day, he agreed to come back the next day and listen to our concerns, and uh, maybe a little bit more of that later. <clears throat> anyway, here we go. All mankind fell in Adam's fall. One common sin infects us all. From sire to son, the bane descends, and over all, the curse impends. What was that common sin that infects us all? Was it that act of Adam and Eve which resulted in God bringing down his curse upon, curse upon all creation? Was it disobedience, failing to heed God's commandment? Was it stealing, taking something that didn't belong to them? Was it coveting, lusting for something which had not been given to them? Was it pride, thinking their opinion was equal with God's wisdom? Was it idolatry, worshiping something other than the Lord God alone? As I've gone back to Genesis 3 over the years, I tend to see all of these things in that first sin. That that first sin was almost like the Big Bang or the Pandora's box. All of these packed into one common sin that infects us all. Is it too great a stretch then to see even unionism in that first sin, as Adam and Eve, in their worship and work, wanted to eat their fruit and keep it too, attempting, in essence, an accord between Christ and Belial, as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 6. While the formal term unionism might not have been coined until later on, I defer to Dr. Noland on to when that exactly happened, and while the brief statement describes unionism as a church fellowship, uh, would we be wrong in asserting that unionism need not be limited to a particular era or a geographic region 
or a class of people or a formal organization. To see it perhaps as something that has been occurring throughout human history. Did unionism need formal dogma or ecclesiastical formation before it could be practiced? Is it possible that long before stone tablets were inscribed with the Decalogue, centuries before the Pentateuch was penned, millennia before the formula of Concord was subscribed, the spirit of unionism was already at work, attempting to mix error with truth, the sacred with the profane, teaching as commandments the doctrines of men which itching ears wanted to hear. Uh, thinking back to Cain and Abel, for example, God came to Cain and said, well, where is your brother? Uh, if I were Cain, I might have said, well, God, is that a rhetorical question? Uh, Abel responded by saying, well, am I my brother's keeper? But what was behind that? You know, why didn't Abel, or why didn't Cain just say, well, Abel's over there in the field. He's, he's dead. He's where I left him. And God might have you know, upbraided him then. And Cain could have said, well, God, you didn't tell me I couldn't kill my brother. Where is that written down that I can't kill my brother? So this sin occurred before, if you will, there was a law written about it. Long before the seventh commandment was ever inscribed into stone. We have that sin and it expresses itself in many ways. And then as Paul writes in Galatians 3, that the law simply exposes and demonstrates, shows us that sin so that we might repent of it. Um, it might also be interesting, I think, to contemplate unionism a little more in, in, in depth because I think there's more there than just uh, trying to join together mixed confessions. Uh, might be interesting to contemplate whether unionism, unionism over the centuries has taken different forms. So was unionism back in the 19th century different than the unionism of the 21st century? Or do they have things in common? One thing, I've, I don't know if your ears picked this up lately within the last year or so, I've been noticing quite frequently, even like Sarah Huckabee and others, when they talk about some of these tragedies we've been seeing, that they are sending their prayers out to people. Well, when did we start doing that instead of praying for people? So when we were, you know, talking, we were often talking about prayer services in the context of unionism. What's going on with people's idea about prayer? Uh, unionism doesn't just take place in isolation. It just doesn't pop up for no reason at all. And I don't know if we would even be able to name the top 10 unionists of all time. But I seem to think that it, unionism pops up when there's times of great crises that occur. So if I hear about a shooting or some other great catastrophe, I'm kind of thinking, okay, there's going to be another prayer service somewhere. Just get ready for it. But when we think about the Prussian Union, well, why did Frederick, um, Friedrich uh, uh, decide to have a Prussian Union? Uh, was it, did it have anything to do with the Thirty Years' War? One of the most disastrous, devastating wars of all time, where uh, if you were to read like in uh, Will and Ariel Durant's The History of Civilization, the description of the, the Thirty Years' War, which was fought over religion, people were starving with the great devastation that they would take down the bodies of men who had just been, criminals who had just been hanged and eat the body. One woman was brought to court because she had killed her own baby for food. They were digging up bodies out of graves that the, the armies going back and forth had so devastated all the farmlands and so forth. And so there was... Uh, great horror and devastation in the Thirty Years' War, all fought over religion. So isn't it a kind of a natural reaction for people to think, well, if that's what religion is going to do. And it's after that time that we find a rise of nationalism and the Enlightenment and uh, Romanticism and rationalism. Those things didn't just happen. I think they happened quite a bit in, in re reference to uh, 
uh, things that were going on in, in human history. Um, so whenever we see these crises happen, I think we can almost get ready to uh, face these kind of things, and they don't take us for, by surprise. But I would always be interested in hearing somebody do a sermon at the time of one of these based on Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. You know this passage, but there were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. That's a once in a lifetime event, isn't it? What a horrible thing. They're in, you know, in church giving their sacrifices and Pilate comes in and, and the blood of bulls and goats they'd used presumably for the forgiveness of sins. Pilate mixed their own human blood with that by killing them. Horrendous. Well, what does Jesus do? Oh, let's have a prayer for these people. No, Jesus says, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. That's a once in a lifetime event. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Jesus says, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What if somebody had said at the time of the downing of the two towers, you think these people had done something wrong that God was angry with them and caused them to die in such a horrible way? No. But unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. So I think one reason that unionism is so pervasive is not just because there are unionistic pastors out there doing such a great job at unionism. I think all of us, if you will, by nature love unionism. We, we like the idea. And so it's maybe easy to be an effective unionist because people's hearts clamor for it. <clears throat> so the second section here, um, I'm going to talk about four different ways that unionism has a kind of counterfeits. So unionism comes in the guise of love. It's a we should not just be talking about the definition of unionism. Well, what, what is love? What do you mean by love? We are experiencing right now uh, an epidemic of uh, uh, op opiates. And it's quite possible that somebody's idea of love is really a, a, an opiate of the people. What do we mean by love? Uh, so unionism, it seems to me, wants to make love a kind of compassion. You know, we feel sorry for you. We feel your pain. But to take note of such passages that the Lord doesn't tell us to be loving unto death and he will give us a crown of life, but to be faithful. We do not read that we are justified by grace through love, but by grace through faith. And I think it's important for us always to make that distinction between fides qua and fides qua. Faith always has to have a content. You can't just say that you believe. There's got to be something that you believe. Um, and the irony, I think, in some of this, in some of these pastors that practice prayer services is that they're trying to proclaim to people that somehow God loves them. When you know a very common argument against Christianity is, I can't believe in a God who would do such things. So how are they going to rectify those two uh, very uh, antithetical ideas about love? Is God a loving God? There are false ideas about love. And you know what one calls a woman who wants to have a husband's love, but at the same time, to retain other lovers, maybe to make a little extra income for the family. 
Such a name is given by the Lord God himself. As we read in Hosea 9, verse 1, Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlots against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. Uh, in my 30 years, I've never been so bold as to refer to the people in the congregation I serve as harlots. Uh, if he had told me that Bremer had tried that once, I might believe it. But uh, he's still here, so I guess it might have worked out okay for him. But the Lord called his people harlots. Doesn't sound like a very loving thing to do. But I believe what the Lord God was trying to do is, hey, wake up. Your idea of love is not the right idea of love. You have not loved me with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, or loved your neighbor as yourself. Um, and I bring that in. So in this next paragraph, if you're kind of loosely following along with me, I had um, noted a comment by Luther from somewhere, which says that the foremost service of love is to teach rightly about religion. The foremost service of love is to teach rightly about religion. And I thought, oh, that's a great quote. I've got to find out where Luther says that. And so I got into my logos, electronic search engine, and it comes up, interestingly, in Luther's commentary on the Song of Solomon. Now, come on, Luther, what, what, how could you possibly work that into the Song of Solomon? And you have the text there. Uh, he's commenting on Solomon, Song of Solomon 4, verse 3. Your lips are like scarlet thread. And he wrote, rosy lips are wonderfully fitting in a girl. The lips further signify the office of teaching. They are paired just as the character of doctrine is also twofold, law and gospel. The fact that they are rosy is a symbol of love. For the foremost service of love is to teach rightly about religion. I know that one reason my wife lets me come to these uh, conferences is because when I come home, it's such a happy homecoming. And uh, some of you might try this. You go home and see your wife again. Dear, your lips are so lovely. They remind me of law and gospel. <laughs> and now, dear wife, I'm going to show you the foremost service of love. I'm going to teach you rightly about religion, all the good things I heard about at the conference. Um, so there is a kind of compassion which says peace, peace, when there is no peace. We read in Ezekiel 10 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, and, you know, what I haven't done lately, and it'd probably be interesting to do, is I'd like to go back to the actual text of the prayer that David Benke used and Pastor Morris used. What, what did they pray about? What was the words of their prayer? Because... Unionism isn't just an act. I mean, we could conceive, it, conceive of it that way, but there are some, some content. What is it that's being said when unionism is being practiced? You know, usually we hear people say, well, isn't it a great thing that the gospel has been proclaimed to these people? Well, is that really what prayer does? Is prayer a proclamation of the gospel? Now, I don't know about you, but there are times when I've forgotten to say something in a sermon and I happen to work it into the prayers. It's really convenient. And, you know, I think sometimes, well, am I writing these prayers so that the people can hear them or so that God can hear them? And what is the difference? Um, and I wonder, you know, in some of these prayer services, if they think that prayer is a proclamation of the gospel, then they're probably writing prayers more so that the people can hear what they have to say than what God is listening to or what God even really wants to hear. As far as I know, Lutherans have not accepted the idea that prayer is a means of grace. So preaching the word, but is praying the same thing? Uh, a lot of people don't know such passages as the, those that we find, like in Proverbs, where uh, we read that uh, those who turn aside their ears from hearing their law, hearing the law, even their prayers are an abomination. So there are prayers 
which are abomination. I can't hardly think of a stronger word. I wish I could say it in Hebrew right now because it would probably be more impressive. But his prayers are an abomination for those who turn their ears aside from hearing the law. Uh, likewise, you can find passages in Jeremiah where God says, Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. I will not hear you. Well, why did God say that? I mean, he's talking about the children of Israel. Why would God say, don't pray for my people? I'm not going to listen to your prayers. So is it a, a valid question to ask when prayers are going on, whether or not the prayer is an abomination because people aren't listening to the law of God, or whether God might even today say, you shouldn't pray for these people. Um, is there ever a situation like that? Is, there, is it okay not to pray? Apparently God thought so at Jeremiah's time, or even in, with James, you know, that the double-minded man should not think he's going to receive anything from God in that prayer. Well, in the, amongst the people where these unionistic prayer services go on, is there any double-mindedness there? Do they think that they can worship the Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ, and some other gods, that it's okay to do that? Uh, well, they really shouldn't be thinking that they're going to be getting anything. Uh, secondly, unionism, I think, often comes in the guise of humility. Uh, the world has its own catalog of sins, I find. I mean, the world has its kind of own ten, its own ten commandments. I've never tried to number them, really. But pride, I think, you know, thou shalt not be proud is one of them. Because proud makes you, pride makes you seem like you're smarter and better than everybody else. And really, who are you to tell me what to do? So unionism seems as though it's not uh, criticizing anybody or judging anybody uh, as being that they're being pride, uh, prideful or uh, being better than anybody else. Um, and then that sort of predisposes people from uh, against hearing the law. They're not, they don't even want to hear the law because that sounds like you're judging me. And if you're judging me, that sounds like you're kind of a proud person, so I really don't want to listen to you. I'm not interested in what you have to say. Uh, so it's no wonder then that unionism has little use for both keys in the office of the keys. Uh, in particular, the binding key doesn't have much use for that. Maybe they would have said, well, you gave me two keys, Lord? No, thanks, I think I'll just use one of them. But he who has only one key really has none at all. Thirdly, unionism comes in the guise of ease. To practice unionism, one doesn't need to know a bunch of theological jargon in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, or German. One does not need to know history or study systematics. Indeed, one does not seem to need to know the word of God at all, except occasionally a, a nice maxim, some favorite beautiful Bible passage to throw out every once in a while. Unionism doesn't care to expend the effort to delve into the meaning of words and therefore has little use for confession, homologuing, to say the same thing as. Uh, it's much easier to take the Humpty Dumpty approach to words. From Alice in Wonderland, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master. That's all. So you're going to be the boss of your own words and decide what they mean instead of having a, a common understanding. And um, it's difficult to come to a common understanding of words. You know, my wife and I have been trying over 30 years to have a common understanding of words, and I still don't always... Uh, know exactly what she's trying to tell me or haven't always agreed with everything she said. Uh, so it takes work, doesn't it? And I've been a part of one of those koinonia groups. Are you familiar with those things that have been going around, Synod? Um, it takes a lot of work to try to come to an agreement on what you're going to say. Sometimes it doesn't work out at all. Um, so it's, it's uh, concord is, is not an easy thing. And sometimes it's easier to take the easy way out. Fourthly, unionism comes in the guise of goodness. 
concerned about making the world a better place, I think. I mean, I, I think the idea is often given that, well, let's all just you know, be one. Let's, let's stop all this arguing about doctrine or let's stop all of this terrorism and fighting. Why, you know, the Rodney King gospel, why can't we all just get along? And that seems good to people. And it seems desirable uh, to people. If they think that all discord and arguing is evil thing, then it must be good for everybody to just go along to get along and to uh, agree with one another. But uh, again, that's not concord, uh, maybe unionism. But I think it's interesting that, you know, really as Christians, we have a completely different view. We are not trying to make the world a better place to live because we know that everything is going to be destroyed. We're not trying to save this world, knowing that God has condemned it to melt with heat. You know, as as St. Peter writes, what kind of people ought we to be, knowing that the world is going to perish? Uh, So we're not trying to make the world a better place to be. In fact, um, I know sometimes people get upset or troubled about when things don't seem very loving or good or easy. Um, And there's one passage by Herman Sasse in his book, This Is My Body. Um, I don't think I can read quite all of it, but I just really appreciate his approach to some of these tensions that we have with regard to unionism and other things, maybe in dealing with the world, uh, which sometimes says, behold how they love one another. Uh, Sasa writes, there is nothing more depressing for the student of church history or for the Christian layman than to read about the great controversies on doctrinal matters that time and again have divided Christendom. At the same time, nothing has provoked more mockery from the world than those occasions when the old saying about the early church, behold how they love one another, could be changed into an ironical, behold how they bite and devour one another. How often such controversy has destroyed the missionary opportunities of the church. Was there a greater missionary possibility than at the moment when Constantine recognized Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire? But to his amazement, the Donatist controversy in Africa, the Arian controversy in the East, which soon spread throughout Christendom, absorbed the strength of the church for generations to such a degree that it could not live up to the task of preaching the gospel to the millions of Roman citizens as it should have done. Is not the same true of our centuries and even of our own age when Christianity in a state of obviously incurable divisions meets the great world religions on the mission fields, politicians inside and outside the church, have always regarded these divisions and it is incomprehensible foolishness and a lack of Christian charity on the part of theologians. Just as Constantine wrote to Athanasius and Arius expressing his astonishment that they regarded their disagreement on the meaning of a certain Bible passage, Proverbs 8, to 31, as church divisive, and admonishing them to follow the example of the philosophers who in similar cases always found it possible to agree on a compromise. So Philip of Hesse, the far-sighted politician of the Reformation, did his utmost in the interest of the common Protestant cause in those fateful years of the Reformation to bring about an agreement between Luther and Zwingli on the basis of a formula acceptable to both parties. In both cases, the well-meant attempt of the secular ruler to restore the unity of the church was unsuccessful. So uh, again, uh, if you want to read that in This Is My Body, it starts on page 107 and following, at least at my uh, edition. I also have a, <clears throat> a blog that I haven't gotten on for years. Uh, it's called blogstool at blogspot.com that I have this posted on. Some of you know the, the term beichstuhl, where a penitent would go to kneel for a private confession and absolution. So I kind of changed it to Blogstool and uh, at blogspot.com. Um, so these four things, unionism comes in the guise of, of love and humility and ease and goodness and uh, can seem very appealing to a worldly way of doing things. And I want to also mention one other factor in the mix. So I think uh, Pastor Freeman alluded to this a little bit too. 
I kind of wonder if we don't somehow uh, allow young pastors coming into the seminary or we don't divest them of certain ideas. Of what was it that made you want to become a pastor and what was it that makes pastors, uh, young men want to become pastors today? I, I think sometimes there's the idea that you know, if I get to be a pastor, I'll get to stand up in front of a bunch of people and give inspiring messages and just love everybody and solve everybody's problems, okay? And, and, and they're going to get Christmas gifts and maybe a new car or, or whatever else that they, they like that kind of respect that people would give a pastor. But nobody's really told them that being a pastor is a lot more like being a garbage collector. You know, if you're doing your work properly, you're taking all of these sins which people confess that burden them and weigh them down and make them feel guilty and ashamed and angry. And when they confess them to you, don't you all know, it weighs you down too. When you know the hurt of your people, it hurts you too. And thanks be to God, we can take all of that and lay that on the shoulders of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can exchange our yokes with him. And he gives us his light burden of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Um, but we're garbage collectors if we're doing our work properly. And I don't know that we've done, uh, I'm, again, I don't know about you, but not a week goes by that I don't feel helpless, utterly helpless when I see some of the things that our members have to go through health-wise and family-wise and so forth. And what that does is it drives me to the cross and to God's word. And, and I can tell my members, I'm honest with them. I, I realize I can't do that much for you, but here's the word of God. Let's cling to this together. Or, or also to tell young men, you know, what is it? You go into the ministry thinking that everybody's going to love you and respect you. Well, guess what? You are going to be hated the first time you come up with something that goes against the ideas of righteousness that your, your people have. You're going to face hatred, just as our Lord Jesus Christ told us ahead of time. I don't know. You know, was, I don't think the Lord was being dishonest when he said, follow me, leave your nets behind. But if the disciples had known everything that they were going to have to go through, would, would they have gone? I don't know. But our Lord Jesus Christ made sure that they were prepared for it, didn't he? And he gave them such words of life and hope and strength that they uh, endured many things for the sake of the gospel. It's kind of a different way of using for the sake of the gospel, isn't it? To suffer for the sake of the gospel instead of trying to promote a false gospel for the sake of the gospel. Um, well, then how do we deal with unionism uh, in all of these different forms? I want to suggest four or five different ways that aren't necessarily so helpful. At least they haven't been for me. And that's sometimes we try to argue purely on a rational basis. Uh, you may have noticed in these days, people don't know how to think logically. They, they don't, they're not very reasonable. And I don't mean they're not reasonable because they don't agree with me, but they don't know how to think things through step by step. Uh, people are more likely to respond to things viscerally. You know, how do I, how, they respond to things on the basis of how they feel rather than, have you thought this through? Now, they don't have the context of, of you know, they, they hate reading, so they don't really have much of a context to draw from. They just know their own personal experiences. And so I find it quite difficult to try to reason with people. And by that, I mean just giving an explanation step by step, bringing out Bible passages and examples from history and so forth. It, it, it's, that's not what they're interested in. And so that's uh, fairly difficult. Uh, G.K. Chesterton quipped that people quarrel because they don't know how to argue. And by that, he meant more of the formal, logical ways of arguing. Or I like what John, uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman wrote in his idea of a university. Quarry the granite rock with razors or moor the vessel with a thread of silk. Then you may hope with such keen and delicate instruments as human knowledge and human reason to contend against those giants, the passion and the pride of man. Okay, so something more than just human reason is needed. And I think we all know that that's the law of God. Um, 
but we're not trying to reason people. We're not trying to use the law to, to reason with them. We're trying to put them to death with the law. Uh, so we agree with Luther that nothing is uh, better known or more common among Christians than uh, assertions. So we certainly do make statements of faith and, and doctrine um, and assert those. Uh, and yet I find it very interesting. Uh, I, I think we ought to be reading more and more of, of the Old Testament prophets these days. I think there, that our age has a lot in common with the uh, period of the, the prophets. And interestingly, you know, Luther was an Old Testament scholar. He wasn't a systematician. Uh, so it you know, always struck me as odd, and maybe you too, why, why did Ezekiel lie on his side for 430 days or cut off his hair and beard using a sword, burning a third of it, uh, throwing a third of it to the wind, and then hacking the remaining third to pieces, or having a vision to cook his food over human excrement? Hosea was commanded to marry a prostitute, and Isaiah went about stripped and barefooted for three years. What? Uh, and I don't have a, a complete answer for this. Maybe you do. You can share with me later. But the, the one thing I think I notice is that the prophets are not trying to reason with people. And these things, perhaps in some way, the Lord God was using, because it was his idea. Uh, they weren't just being creative evangelists. Um, to get people's attention, to shock them in a way that they weren't prepared to, to deal with. Uh, so reason is sometimes difficult. And, and dealing with these prophets, and we yesterday we sung the Te Deum, and I never, uh, whenever I sing that now, I'm thinking in particular about, um, you might have to help me out here, the, the glorious company of the, pos of the uh, prophets, the goodly fellowship of the apostles, the noble army of martyrs. Uh, are you kidding me? Do you think it, uh, hanging around with the prophets would have been a goodly uh, fellowship? Do you think being with the apostles and all their sufferings and travels was a glorious, it would have been a glorious thing to accompany them, uh, worldly speaking, and a noble army of martyrs? What kind of an army gets mowed down, uh, you know, just eaten by lions and crucified and stuff just like that? What kind of a noble army is that? And then followed by, and the holy church throughout all the world. Oh, what church are you talking about? You know, I've always wanted to be called to a holy church. Uh, it would have been a lot easier, I think, maybe to be a pastor. But no, it's precisely these things that, that we have uh, almost a paradox when the Lord talks about um, his prophets and apostles this way. We've got to keep that in mind. Secondly, synodical overtures. They haven't seemed to me like they've accomplished a whole lot. Sometimes they appreciate the whereas this. They're, they're better written than CTCR documents sometimes. But uh, as you know, and some of you could probably state it better than I can, but I learned later on that uh, once the overture is passed and the therefores are accepted, that doesn't mean that you're also accepting all the whereases. And that's sometimes the best part of a overture. But uh, I'd like overtures to be an opportunity, especially the theological ones, to express law and gospel, uh, and uh, not just, again, be rationalizations. Um, election campaigns, as you know, they don't always give us a great deal of hope. And I sometimes when I've been elected to things, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. But so far, I haven't been satisfied. Uh, social media, yeah, I've spent my time doing uh, blogs and creating websites and uh, posting on various listservs. Uh, and sometimes, quite honestly, I, humanly speaking, I've realized that when I'm frustrated with my own congregation and they're not listening to me, it seems a lot easier just to get on the internet and start posting things and hoping that maybe somebody will listen to me there. Um, but again, I haven't been called you know, to the internet. Maybe somebody will think about that in the synod and have a a missionary to the internet some days, and you can just go around all day and post on blog sites. I, how am I doing for time? I'm probably over, over now, right? 